In this video, I'll give some examples and description of projection functions, also of a process of using projection functions to predict a sequence, including cobweb diagrams, and then I'll introduce the idea of fixed points of projection functions, which correspond to equilibria for a sequence. We start by introducing the definition of a projection function. So recall that a sequence is defined recursively. If knowing one value in the sequence allows you to predict the next value in the sequence using a rule or formula. So for example, I have a arithmetic sequence here. Uh, the first term is 4, the next term is 1, the third term is negative 2, then negative 5, and then negative 8. And if I look at the pattern, um, I'm getting each term by subtracting 3 from the previous sequence. And so that's what we're talking about when we can use a rule to find the next value in a sequence. So that is, there's, there's a function that takes a sequence value as its input, and the output of that function is the next value of the sequence. And that function is called the projection function. So if we go and look at our examples, um, our arithmetic sequence, we saw that the next value in a sequence, which we represent with x subscript n plus 1, is our current value of a sequence, xn, and we subtract 3 each time. So for example, if I used n equals to 2, that would tell me that x subscript 3, because that's 2 plus 1, is going to be equal to x subscript 2, the second value of my sequence, minus 3. And so the third value, which is negative 2, is equal to 1 minus 3. Now, interpreting our equation as a uh, projection function, here's my equation. My input is my original value, so let's Think of that as my input, and my output, that's this xn plus 1, is given by my input minus 3. So my projection function for any input is that input minus 3. And that would be the projection function belonging to my first sequence. If I next consider this geometric sequence, um, if I think about the sequence pattern, we should see that each time I go from 1 to 2, then 2 to 4, then 4 to 8, then 8 to 16, what we're doing is my next value in my sequence is double the current value in my sequence. And that means that my projection function, if I thought of my current value as the input, my output is double my input. And so the projection function for this geometric sequence, given any input that I'll call x, it's double the input for my output. And this is the rule that defines my sequence. That's my projection function. And in principle, any function could be used as a projection function. So in this example, I'm just taking a function, f of x is 1 plus the square root of x. And then to reconstruct my sequence, we need an initial condition. And for us, that initial condition corresponds to the first value in my sequence. And then what we'll do is we'll repeatedly use the function to find subsequent values in the sequence. And that corresponds to our equation that our next value is given by the function of the first value. So this is my recursive formula. And if I were to write that explicitly in my terms of my function, that says that the next value in my sequence is what I get if I put u subscript n in my input, so it's 1 plus the square root of u subscript n. Now, the projection function captures all of that in a single statement. What we'll do next is I want to illustrate how the projection function allows me to calculate values. So let's create a table, n and un. 
we know that I start with the index of 1, that my initial value is 3. And our recursive formula says that to get the second value in my sequence, my formula should be 1 plus the square root of the first value. In other words, it's 1 plus the square root of 3. Now, there's going to come a point where I can't just keep writing down these formulas, so instead we'll use a calculator to compute the value, which for this value, our calculator approximation gives us 2.732 uh, to three decimal places. So that's our second value in our sequence. Now the third value, let's make our table bigger, the third value is given by our recursive formula, 1 plus the square root of u subscript 2. Now if I were to do the exact value, that would be 1 plus the square root of 1 plus the square root of 3. And so you can see that this is going to get progressively worse. On my calculator, what I'll do is I'll do 1 plus the square root of the answer I got on the previous step. So 1.2.732. So I'll take the square root of the answer, and I'll add 1, and I get an approximate value of 2.653. And now I can continue the process. The fourth sequence is approximately given by 1 plus the square root of 2.653, which is going to be given by... 2.629 and I, I have my next value in my sequence. So this is how I would use the projection function uh, to be able to calculate those sequential values. Now I want to show you a trick. If you have a calculator that has an answer recall button uh, then there's a pretty cool way of being able to compute the value of the sequence on a calculator. So I'm going to explain how I would do this on, for example, my TI-83. Um, what I would do is I would start by entering the initial value. So I'd put 3, and then I would enter. And let's just um, use this arrow as, as an enter symbol. So now the thing is, that's now the last answer of my calculator. So if I were to push the ANS button, ANS currently has a value of 3, and I can use that in my next calculation. So what I'll do now is I'll calculate on my calculator 1 plus the square root of the ANS, the answer of the previous result. And so what it'll do now is it'll use the square root of that answer and gives me the second value in my sequence, um, which we had our approximate value, let me just recall that, 2.732. So this was approximately 2.732. Now, once I've done that calculation, oh, I hit uh, the equals or the enter, I forgot to say that, so then we enter, and that's now in my, um, my answer. The thing is that my calculator has now updated the answer to be that new value. But the cool thing is it's not just remembering four decimal places, it's actually remembering all of the decimal places. And so now if I repeat the process and type it again, 1 plus the square root function of my answer, it will give me the next value, which is approximately 2.653, and that's now stored in my answer. Now the next cool thing is on a TI-83 and 84, there's another button that's next to the Enter button that's called Entry which on the TI uh, looks like it's the second enter. And what this will do is it'll actually recall your formula. 
So all I have to do is I just keep hitting entry and then enter and it will continue to use the same formula but every step it'll use my new value and this will give me my entire sequence progressively starting with my starting value. So I encourage you to try this out on your calculator. Um, take a break from this, uh, try this out and see if you can generate your sequence. On the previous slide we had our projection function represented by a formula and given a formula we could find the exact or at least decimal approximation value of each term in the sequence. Now a function can also be represented through a graph. So here I have a function y equals f of x. Um, it's, I, I created it as a cubic but we don't actually know the formula here so I just have some curve, a representation of what's going to happen in my projection function. And we can use a graph to be able to calculate our sequence values just like we would with a formula, but as we'll see is it's going to be too hard to get very precise answers, so we'll only be able to approximate our values. But let's, let's see how this would work. So our initial value is that we start at 1. And the idea of the recursive formula is our current value is the input and the output value what's coming out of the function this is the y value of the axis sorry y value of the graph uh, this will be the next value in the sequence so what we'll do is we'll go to our graph and we'll start at our initial value of 1 so this is, on our x-axis, this is our current value of our sequence. And we're going to interpret our y-value as the next value, in other words, x n plus 1. So if I have 1, and I look at my graph, then I follow that up to our graph and I get a point approximately there. And here's where you can start to see how I'm going to have to approximate. As I go to my read off what y value that is, I'm getting some y value in here between 1 and 2 and I have to guess what that is. And I'm going to guess that it's approximately 1.6. But because it's a graph and I don't have an exact value. I actually don't know how close I am. So let's create a little table so we can keep track of these things. We started at a value of 1, and we've just predicted that the next value is approximately 1.6. Now, once I know the second value of the sequence, I can use it as my next input. So I, again, have to approximate 1.6 is approximately here, and now I'm going to use the graph, let's change color again, to predict our next value in our sequence. So I get a point up on my graph somewhere around here that I have to again estimate, and that looks maybe 2.75, 2.8. So our third value in our sequence is approximately maybe 2.75. It's hard to say. I don't know exactly how accurate that would be. But now that I know that value, I just continue to repeat the cycle. So go to about that same spot on my x-axis for my next input, and I can predict that my fourth sequence value has to be somewhere close to 5, so we are looking maybe 4.8, I'd say, maybe. So the fourth value is about 4.8. Now, I could continue to do this. Uh, the further away I go, the more that my errors are going to propagate. So a little error at the early steps is going to lead to estimation errors later that get bigger and bigger, maybe. Uh, 
sometimes they get smaller, but this is an approximation of my sequence. So to summarize the steps, what we do is we take our most recent value from the sequence, so the most recent value, and we'll find it on the x-axis. So this is the axis associated with the current value of the sequence. And then we'll read from the graph the function value of that sequence. And I'll use it, use the y value, to estimate the next value in the sequence, which is xn plus 1. So this is how I can use a graph to be able to create a sequence. As we saw in the previous slide, if I try to use a graph to estimate my sequence, it's hard to get accurate sequence values. But we can use a graph to allow us to get qualitative behavior of the sequence. So we shouldn't use a graph to try to get precise um, numerical values, but we can use it to try to get the behavior. So this next paragraph just reminds us that the steps that we went through to use a projection functions graph were that we first found a spot on our x-axis, which is our previous value, and then we'll use the graph to predict the value for the next sequence. The idea of a cobweb diagram is that we're going to start with just the original graph, y equals f of x, but we're going to add a second piece. We're going to draw the line y equals x. And the purpose of this line is going to be to allow us to update our uh, sequence position on the x-axis by just drawing a horizontal line. So let's go through the example we did on the last problem where, if you recall, we started with an initial value of 1. So as I look at this cobweb diagram, think about the steps we did last time. We used the value of the sequence to predict the value of our new sequence. So we go vertically to a point on our graph, y equals f of x. And for a cobweb diagram, we do that by actually drawing a line. So we vertically find the new sequence. Now, we need to shift to our new x-coordinate, which, if you recall, was somewhere down about here. But instead of going down to the x-axis, by drawing the line y equals x, we accomplish the same thing by drawing a horizontal line to y equals x. And so this becomes aligned. We don't actually draw this, but it's aligned with where I would have been if I had started there. And so now I can use this as my new starting position, and this is my new current value of my sequence. So this is x2. Right? So here I was at x1, and now I've just found x2. And to find x3, we're going to continue the process. So we will again use our projection function. So we go to the graph of our projection function, and we get our next value of our sequence, which now looks like about 3, which I think is different than I had last time because of my presumably approximation errors. And I'll update by drawing a horizontal line until I reach the blue line. And this becomes my next value of my sequence. So here I am at x3. It happens to be 3, or close to it. And I'll continue this process making a prediction, changing my sequence to my new value, and I'll repeat that. <clears throat> now notice what happened this time. Um, my prediction for the next sequence I actually have to go down. So vertical doesn't always mean up. 
this will be my next sequence value. So they have a hard time drawing right on where I want to be. Now notice, because I came down, the next time I draw a horizontal line, it will be to the left. I have My sequence has just decreased. So I'm going to now draw my horizontal line, always going towards y equals x. And so our next value is somewhere there, or approximately there. Okay? So as I, as I went through that, I can now approximate the values of my sequence. Let's see, we had x3, x4 was somewhere way over here, so a big value, x4, and then x5 came in somewhere around there. And I would now continue the process. Uh, as the sequence continues, this cobweb diagram can get fairly complicated, which is actually why it's called a cobweb diagram. So we just continue this process. And um, you can start to see that the accuracy is hard to maintain when we're just doing it by hand. So it's, this is almost the same spot as it was previously. A little bit to the right, and I would just continue that pattern. Um, so what it kind of looks like this function, the sequence is doing, is it looks like I sort of rise up until I reach somewhere up here in the peak, at which time I've gone too far, and then I'll drop down and then start the process over, stepping up. And if this was in a population, uh, this might be uh, sort of a carrying capacity, and if I overshoot the capacity my population will crash that next time. Now that we have the ideas of projection functions and the cobweb diagram, we'll introduce the idea of a fixed point. So a fixed point for a projection function is a value for which the output of the projection function is the same as the input. And what that means is that my sequence, if I define it um, through this projection function, uh, my sequence isn't going to be changing. It'll, it'll be steady. Now on a cobweb diagram, this corresponds to a point where the y equals f of x graph intersects the y equals x graph. And so on our previous example, uh, we saw a point uh, that I happen to call the carrying capacity where we had a fixed point. Now, if I have a fixed point, what I mentioned earlier is that if I have a sequence, then once I touch the fixed point, my sequence will stay at that fixed point for every point after that. So you might jump around for a while, but if you ever land on a fixed point, you're stuck. And so we say that that fixed point is called an equilibrium for the sequence. Now there are possibility that a um, there are multiple fixed points. And so the definition of a sequence might, in fact, have multiple equilibria. Now, when we graphically look for fixed points, we just look for where y equals x intersects y, uh, the f of x graph. In the example that I show, I have an algebraic representation. We saw this earlier, where I have a function uh, defined algebraically. Now, if I want to find the fixed points, then what I need to do is I will need to solve an equation. We're going to solve the equation f of x equals x, but we'll replace f of x with its formula. So we're going to solve this equation 1 plus the square root of x equals x. And um, this, this representation is maybe a little hard to see, um, there are a couple ways we could proceed. So one approach would be to first isolate the square root and then uh, square both sides. And so what that would mean is I would take square root of x is equal to x. We have to subtract one from both sides. And now I could square both sides. so that I get square root of x squared is x, 
and then to square x minus 1 I would expand that so that's x minus 1 times x minus 1 I get with foil x squared minus 2x plus 1 and now I have an equation that doesn't involve square roots it just involves a quadratic so we will subtract x from both sides and we get a new equation x squared minus 3x plus 1 equals 0 and the quadratic formula uh, will give me two answers so let's see I like to sing this one x equals negative b so negative 3 negative x equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared that's 9 minus 4ac so that's minus 4 all over 2a that's 2 and so this approach predicts two values 3 plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2 now it turns out one of those is what's called an extraneous solution um, I want to show you the other way to do this So the other way that we might try to solve this is to treat <clears throat> the square root of x as a variable itself so we're going to introduce a new variable call it square root of x and our original equation becomes 1 plus u equals u squared so now as I try to solve this um, I again get a quadratic formula u squared minus u uh, let's see minus 1 equals 0 and I will again solve this let's see two solutions u equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared is 1 minus 4ac so that's plus 4 all over 2a I get 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2 now the thing is again I get two solutions but by paying attention to the fact that my original variable the square root of x has to be a positive number tells me that of my two solutions u equals 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2 that's going to be valid but u equals 1 minus the square root of 5 over 2 that's a negative answer and that's my extraneous root. Now once I know what the square root of x is, so this is the square root of x is equal to this, I get my actual value by squaring this value. So it's 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2 squared, which I could expand. So let's see, that's 1 plus 2 square roots of 5 plus 5 divided by 4 so that gives me 6 plus 2 square roots of 5 over 4 factor out a 2 because I need to simplify my fraction 3 plus square root of 5 over 2 times 2 that's the 4 and I get one of the answers that I found originally 3 plus the square root of 5 divided by 2 and so if I compare that to my original strategy that's the positive solution uh, there's another solution that didn't happen to be a real solution so 3 plus square root of 5 over 2 is valid but x equals 3 minus square root of 5 over 2 is extraneous and it would have come from that extraneous square root of x that we found earlier. So this function has one um, fixed point and if I were to graph it, so let's draw our axes, 1 plus the square root um, looks something like this and if I graphed y equals x, I'd get a line like this. And what we have found is we have found a fixed point where y equals f of x and y equals x intersect. So that if I use 
3 plus the square root of 5 over 2 as my input, I get 3 plus the square root of 5 over 2 as the output. And so if my sequence ever happened to go here, I would get that forever. And that's the idea of a fixed point. What we'll talk about uh, in future classes is the idea of stability of a fixed point and try to understand if a sequence is going to go closer and closer to a fixed point or if it's going to move away. All right. Thanks for watching. Hope that helped.